So hello everyone and welcome to this uh, this week of Sangha Lives Daily Meditations. It's uh, wonderful as always to be here with all of you. And, uh, realizing it's a bank holiday in the UK today, so extra appreciative of all of those getting up early on a, on a weekend. Uh, equally appreciative, appreciative of all of you here, uh, whatever your time zone, wherever you are in the world, and whatever conditions you're in, coming here this morning. And, uh, yeah, really beautiful as always to feel the community gathering. I think for many of you now used to this new platform, for me, it's only the second time, so still getting used to it, but uh, having a sense of the the warmth and the connection and the sense of community, still the same. Yeah, different platforms, different conditions, different locations, and yet that sense of community that's built here uh, over these three years now, very powerful yeah, beyond that the how that we are meeting together so yeah warm deep heartfelt welcome to to everyone some of you have been here through the three years some of you may be dropping in for the first time today and uh everyone is equally welcome maybe coming back after a while deeply welcome equally welcome to this shared space of practice of um, dharma deepening understanding into our experience a deep heartfelt welcome to all of you and um yeah as people are saying in the chat also today may 1st Day of the workers, for those who may remember. Let's see, I'm wearing red. <laughs> and, uh, it always makes me smile. It's the day my, my mum always tells me that when she was growing up, in her socialist family, they always used to eat red food on May 1st. <laughs> um, definitely not red meat. It was tomatoes and beetroot and peppers and things like that. So it's kind of a funny way of commemorating this day. So as always, the session will include uh, a short reflection on the theme of the week and of the day, uh, a guided practice together, about half an hour, and then time at the end for some um, questions um, and responses from me, and I'll say a bit more about that when we get to that point. Um, and yeah, just breathing and taking it all in, a real sense of uh, of appreciation. And what I wanted to reflect on together um, through this week and then uh, in particular today is that in any moment of experience, yeah, any moment of experience that um, occurs, that arises for us, um, there is an object in attention. So there's always an object in attention. And there's also a way of relating to that object. And, and you know, some of you have heard this many times, and some of you may be new. It may sound very obvious. It may sound like, what's she talking about? <laughs> but we can just break it down and see these two elements come together to construct and shape what we experience, an object and attention and the way of relating to that object. So we can say, you know, like an example, you know, I have a cold. Yeah? So my attention keeps going to the um, sensations, of a, kind of a, a blocked nose and, and kind of a phlegmy, um, you know, area of, of the face and the head. So that's an object in attention. The attention is getting drawn to that object. And then there's the way of relating to it. 
And that way of relating shapes uh, what the experience actually is. So it might be a version that would be quite a, a usual <laughs> way of relating to the experience. Or well, maybe curiosity and interest. Well, what is this? How, how is this? What is this like? What are the details of the experience? It might be compassion. It just, oh yeah, that's, that's a little bit unpleasant. How can I meet this? And so the way we relate to the experience uh, really impacts, the way we relate to the object, sorry, really impacts what the experience is like. And this is quite radical and profound because typically we fixate on the object and we take um, the entirety of the experience to be in the object itself rather than in the way that we relate to it. So. Yeah, kind of the what we pay attention to and the how. And there's quite um, a range of possibilities there for us. Because the what we pay attention to is not fixed. Yeah, the attention has habits, it goes to particular things, but it's not fixed. It's not, um, uh, it's not a given that we have no agency with. And then also the how. So in that example, another example of this, uh, which I've already given in one Dharma talk, so apologies, I think some of you may have been there um, a few weeks ago, I went to the dental hygienist to get out my teeth cleaned. And, you know, for me, I don't know how it is for, for, for all of you, the actual sensations are not that pleasant, they're actually quite painful. Um, so the attention goes there, that becomes the object of attention. Um, and so I was sitting there, feeling the pain, kind of blah, blah. so we do. And I thought, well, let's let's make a practice of this. What if I shift my attention somewhere else? So we could already see the way of relating to the experience is interest, curiosity, creativity, and then the possibility to actually bring the attention to something else. So I kept bringing my attention to my feet instead of my mouth area where it was going. Mm -hmm. And then the experience became very different from an unpleasant experience. It became a completely okay experience. And the habit comes, it keeps drawing the attention back to the mouth and the unpleasant sensations. But there's the capacity to keep moving it back to the feet and then having um, a very different experience right there. And this is essentially what we do in meditation, right? We're practicing, we're developing the skill to have some agency around where we place our attention. And we choose neutral objects in our practice. We choose neutral objects, the breath, the body, sound. These are relatively neutral objects they're not that interesting for us they're not where our attention naturally goes and so we use them to develop this skill of having a volition of having a choice training the mind to um kind of attend with intention not just out of habit and this can greatly reduce um the degree of suffering in our lives, the degree of dukkha of ill-being in our lives, you know, for ourselves and for others. You know. And it also greatly uh, deepens our wisdom and understanding, because what does that mean yeah. if I can do that? You know. What does that mean if I can develop the skill to, to kind of have agency around where my attention goes and then how I relate to it as well? So this is our path and this is our goal. Yeah, to have this flexibility, pliability of mind, to choose where to place attention and then to uh, sustain attention there and to relate to the objects of our attention in ways that bring uh, well-being. This is the, the path and the goal, it's the thread of insight that leads us all the way from dukkha, from ill-being, from uh, struggle with experience, from the push and pull of wanting this and not wanting that, all the way to uh, a life of freedom. And so again, yeah, this is the wisdom, this is the thread of insight. Experience is shaped, it's constructed, it's fabricated. 
doesn't just happen of itself. And we can play with the building blocks of our experience. We can attend to our experience in ways that um, nourish more well-being over time. Yeah, over time. And we make this journey uh, something of interest in itself. So maybe, you know, you might try what I just described on the, at the dentist's and think, oh, I can't do this. You know? But of course you can. I just need to practice a little bit more. And we start with our very basic practice. And remembering this is what we're doing by bringing attention to relatively neutral objects in our meditation practice. And by doing that with interest, with kindness, with presence. You know, so these are all ways of relating already that we're cultivating. This is something uh, we can bring to our practice, both in formal practice and in our lives, because our practice is not limited just to the formal meditation time. It's the wisdom that we're cultivating, that we bring to the path. We can remember at any point, this moment of experience is constructed, it's conditioned, it's shaped, it's fabricated, including by my habits of attention, including by the way of relating. And the way of relating is something I can change. I've got agency and possibility with it. Yeah? Equally, the object of attention can also sometimes be something that I change. And so remembering that, that yeah, it's possible to cultivate, it's possible to train in these skills, and it's possible to cultivate um, that flexibility of mind to shift between objects and to sustain with an object, and also to shift, to change, to flow between different ways of relating to an experience. So that's what we're going to explore. And, um, yeah, let's explore that in our in our practice. So if you're not already in a comfortable posture for your meditation, then uh, please find one. And whether you're You've already been in your meditation posture for a while, and you're just settling into it. It's taking the time to make any adjustments that may be needed so that the body's stable, steady, supported as possible. Settling in, having a sense of taking your place in this moment of experience, whether it's taking your seat or you're standing, taking a stand, you're walking, you're just having a sense of taking your place if you're reclining. So that is coming fully into the body as fully as you can. As you come into the body, coming into this moment. Taking your place on this earth with reverence, with kindness, with interest. Inviting the awareness more deeply and fully into the body. It's helpful. We can use the contact sensations between the body and that which supports the body. The ground, the seat, mat.
feeling the sensations of contact between the body and that which supports it and inviting the awareness to settle and ground. with the sensations into the sensations of contact. Gathering, collecting the awareness, the attention with the sensations of contact. And from there, allowing the awareness to open. It's helpful staying rooted in the contact sensations. Inviting the awareness to open and spread and expand from that rootedness. Into more of the body space. Getting a sense, if possible, of the expansiveness of the body and the awareness through the body. As far as feels accessible for you. Field of awareness open through the body. The whole body. Within this field, the intention, the practice to be an act of kindness, remembering kindness and interest and how we relate to our practice, how we relate to ourselves, to the world. This practice is a movement, is an act of kindness in the world. And then choosing a particular anchor, object of attention for this time. Maybe those sensations of contact that we are exploring or the movement of the breath through the field of awareness, through the field of the body. If it's more accessible for you, the arising of sound in awareness. Taking a few moments to find the appropriate object for you for this time. Something that's relatively accessible. Making an intention. to bring our attention to this object and to sustain it with the object in kindness, as an act of kindness. This is not a battle, it's a movement of kindness in the world. It's a movement of interest into that which liberates and frees. So 
So settling your attention with the object you've chosen for this time. As much as possible, keeping the awareness grounded in the body, as much of the body as is possible. And within that expansiveness, that particular object, breath, body sensations, and rising being known in the body space. Attending with kindness and interest. Let's explore this silently for that.
of noticing what you notice what's unfolding in experience in this moment without judgment with that same movement of kindness and interest and attention if necessary regrounding in the body and the contact sensations and opening the space of awareness through the body tuning more fully tuning more fully to the object and attention that you've chosen for this period of practice the breath sound body and doing it a tuning and attending with care with presence with kindness and with interest Whatever we find, whether the mind is wandering or present, right here and now the opportunity to realign with our intention, to gather our attention. Practice as an act of kindness and interest over and over again. Receiving the breath, the sound, the body, whatever your object, receiving it with interest and kindness, opening to it with interest and kindness. As often as needed.
but small pausing to notice what's unfolding in your experience. Remembering this moment of experience is constructed, conditioned by the object and attention in a way of relating to that object. What happens if I bring forth this attitude of kindness and interest to meet whatever is in attention in this moment? And then with that kindness, with that curiosity, re-establish or deepen the attention with the chosen object of attention, with a breath or with a sound. Remembering there's something we can do in any moment, realigning, re-establishing, Remembering the kindness and the interest that are possible for us. Appreciating this moment of breathing or hearing or body life. One moment at a time. Moment by moment we nourish. We nourish this skill and this understanding to relate in ways that reduce our being and that nourish well-being. To bring attention intentionally and to sustain it with kindness. This is our practice, this is our path. Let's continue. Moment by moment. Breath being known, sound being known. In kindness, with interest. With an expansive awareness through the body again and again.
So once more, meeting the experience unfolding in this moment with interest, curiosity and care. Reattuning to the object of attention. Over and over again. And for the last minute or two of the practice. Attending to the object in ways that bring more ease, more well-being, whatever that might be for you. Just exploring that. May our practice together be a nourishment for each of us. May our practice together be a nourishment for the well-being of all beings, including ourselves. So taking your time, not rushing to change your posture or to open the eyes, really taking time with that, having that sense of continuity as you shift, as you move, um, as you take in more sensory input from the environment. And before we open to questions, I'd just like to um, offer some uh, reflections on dana practice. So as I think you mostly know, and it's been there in the information as you've come into the session, these sessions are offered in the spirit of dana, which means they're offered without um, a fixed price. Yeah, so anyone can be here. Everyone is welcome to be here, regardless of their financial uh, situation. That's the tradition that we are part of. The teachings are offered in that way. And there's an invitation to uh, support, you know, to support the Sangha Live platform, you know, which has a lot of running costs, and to support the teachings uh, via this particular teacher this week uh, in whatever way is possible for you. And so, um, I thought that for today it could be really interesting to um, to explore uh, this kind of sense of well-being as we practice dana. Uh, to see, um, you know, is there something here in the giving that I can relate to and connect to? Like, can I feel the well-being that comes from supporting uh, the wholesome, from supporting that which is benefiting myself and benefiting others? And to be really attuned to that, 
Buddha used to say the joy in the intention to give, the joy in the giving, the joy in the reflection um, on our own generosity uh, in retrospect. And of course, all of this includes your particular uh, circumstances and what is possible for you. So we always bring that in, you know, the feeling that movement of wishing to support and then um, and then kind of uh, marrying that, balancing that with what is possible for us. And I will, uh, when we finish um, in 15 minutes, I will put, uh, share the screen with the link um, to the Sangha Live Connect donation page uh, that you can use. Uh, to, to offer the Dharma. So we also have time and thank you. you know, whatever you give this week, I forgot to say, whatever you give this week um, will be shared between um, Sangha Live to cover the costs of running these sessions and myself uh, to support my livelihood uh, for offering the teachings. So we've had a couple of questions already, uh, which I will I'll respond to in a moment just to say if you have a question feel free to put it in the chat if you can as other people have done um, put a uh, question in capital letters to begin with it makes it easier for me to um, to to notice that it's a question rather than just a comment in the chat okay so the first question I find my attention is conditioned a lot on recent and historic incidents. Brief context. Uh, I have ADHD and also unpacking trauma and dealing with regular triggers from an unhealthy relationship. I can bring loving kindness to myself, um, but keeping an object of attention is very hard right now. But my mind doesn't seem to have the ability to stay with an object of att attention for more than a few seconds before it jumps into the firefight. There's my mental health situation. I'm wondering if even trying to keep an object of attention is too much to ask of myself and layering unkindness onto my experience. But I desperately want my mind brain to calm down. I practice as best I can in my daily life and regularly on the kitchen. I'm meeting frustration. How do you suggest I work with this during this coming week of our 7 a.m. meditations? Thank you. Um, thank you, Heidi. That's a really um, important question. And thank you for sharing that. How do we work uh, with our practice at times when uh, we are processing a lot of triggering um, things? Yeah, both um, things from the past, uh, both the mind that is kind of um, more inclined to, to move you know, away from and then trauma you know, and triggers that arise. And so the mind is reacting. So one thing that can be helpful is to just acknowledge that what the mind is doing it's coming from a wish to look after you. So it's not helpful, it's agitating, but the mind is going into its patterns yeah, as a way of supporting you to get through what you're um, going through. So sometimes just seeing that, so mind is not the enemy and we need to work with the conditions that we're in rather than um, against them. Uh, you mention that it's possible for you to bring loving kindness to yourself. That's huge and that's wonderful. And I would say prioritize that. Yeah, so if you can bring loving kindness to yourself, make that the main practice in whatever way is helpful for you. So rather than using a neutral object in that, in that sense, like the breath, use the loving kindness as the thing you are nourishing, you're cultivating, you're bringing um, forth as much as possible. Um, it may also be helpful as a practice. So this is one possibility you know, that I would, I would really encourage. Say, what happens if I make the meditation sessions about loving kindness? Yeah. And as you're doing, also bring that into the day as much as possible, just dropping it in, you know, just dropping it in through the day. Um, I would also say that it may sometimes be when there's a lot going on, for us emotionally, mentally, uh, sitting still can actually um, be too much for the system. Yeah, sometimes not. Yeah, and some things you can do when you're sitting still is actually uh, instead of having a um, kind of uh, um, like a neutral and um, what's the word I'm looking for. 
an object that is is uh, is not moving is kind of still. Uh, I'm not finding the word. Excuse me, <laughs> in Israel at the moment, so it's Hebrew mode in my brain rather than the English. Um, actually, using uh, an object that's more that's got more aliveness and got it's got more movement to it and more um, agency. It's it's more active. It's more creative. So say um, having a sense of the contact areas of the body with the ground and a sense of really resting into that and letting all the thinking, all the activation just go down and kind of, you know, the Buddha used to say, give it to the earth. Yeah, just giving it to the earth for it to to um, recycle it, yeah, it's like recycle that energy. Or breathing, if you're using the breath, if that's a helpful thing for you, breathing in a way that soothes and nourishes and calms. Yeah. So those can also be things that you do uh, in, in a still practice. Another thing that you can do, and I'm sorry if I'm over giving you too many possibilities, but let's hope that one of these will work, is actually to do... Um, walking practice including in the sessions that we do here together sometimes the not being still but actually uh, moving the body can be really help helpful so doing walking practice um and using the meta the loving kindness in the walking yeah or having a sense of that as you step on the earth you are you're letting go of the agitation in the heart and mind into the earth um and the last thing I would say is contact, touch can really help. So whether you're sitting, whether you're walking, whether you're standing, lying down, um, through your day in formal practice, just having a sense of contact um, of body with body can really support a sense of grounding and nourishment. So I hope, um, I hope that's helpful. Um, for you, and let me know if you have a follow up question on that. Um, yeah. So, we have another question there from Law. I'd really appreciate your thoughts and advice. Something that is coming up for me and has been quite profound for the past six weeks is an increased sensitivity to people's emotions. I seem to be sensing them in everyone I connect with, even if fleetingly and non verbally. And it's quite intense and it can be quite uncomfortable and overwhelming and difficult to process. I'm particularly sensitive to what feels like people's repressed anger. So, yeah, sometimes uh, some of us or at certain periods will feel an increased sensitivity to other people, particularly to their emotions. Um, and it seems like particularly anger is something that you're attuned to, that you pick up. Um, and that that feels quite intense. You know? So a few things I would suggest for that. Um, one is seeing if you can ground in the body as much as possible. Yeah? In, ground in the body and so uh, noticing where it's helpful to ground it can be the feet as I've said it can be um, the belly area for many of us really helpful you know the central area of our body might be the hands is another place which is um, both hands and feet are places we don't bring our attention to a lot but they actually have quite a lot of aliveness in, in them when we bring the attention um, and having a sense of something bigger than you this can also be helpful so maybe the the, the earth again and actually if you can use imagery the sense of the earth kind of holding you so that these emotions that you're picking up they have more space than just your own our heart mind so the body helps with that and then bigger than the body the earth or the sky or the space around and then having that kind of playing with you know you pick up on these um, frequencies of emotions whatever they are and even with a, a slight um, verbal noting just kind of letting them go you might even say they're not mine yeah they're not mine and I you know I care about these other people but these are not my emotions to 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 hold and just see if you can let them go and yeah, kind of let them um, 
kind of um, be let go of into the space around you, into the earth, up into the sky. Play, play to see what what is helpful. Sometimes out the back of the body um, can also be interesting. So playing with all of that to, to kind of both increase the space, increase the sense of grounding and the letting go. And if possible for you with a lot of sense of compassion and care for yourself, your body, heart, mind is the vehicle um, that's processing all of this. So kind of having a sense of, of a care, kindness, compassion towards this body, heart, mind that is kind of, you know, receiving more stimulation then uh, it can handle right now. So we open up the space for it. We kind of fill that space with compassion, care, kindness, um, and we kind of allow things just as they come in to also move through. This is why the back of the body can be interesting. Yeah, because we might feel, ah, it's coming in here. And then we just let it flow through out. Yeah, and, and keep flowing. This is not mine. Yeah, I care about other beings care for myself, this is not mine to hold on to. And really kind of letting that and uh, those energies um, continue on their way um, as much as possible. So I hope that's helpful, Laura. Do let me know if, if I didn't quite um, respond to what you were asking or you'd like any clarification. And then we'll just take a little pause, see if there's any other questions that arise. Wonderful. Yes, thanks, Patricia. I forgot I said that. Yeah. Attending to our experience with playfulness and kindness is always a good way. Um, yeah. And it doesn't mean, you know, the playfulness doesn't mean that things aren't hard or that they're not um, needing our attention, you know, but actually, ah, how can we meet this? How can we meet this you know, in skillful ways? And it's an exploration for us in our lives and our practice, right? Yeah. So. Maybe just uh, you know, to say, I was just this weekend in Palestine with a group of practitioners um, on a working retreat with our good friends there. And, you know, again, this comes forth, you know, people um, living in really, really challenging conditions of various kinds, you know, including health, including living under military occupation. Um, and yet that capacity to to not to kind of have some agency around what we bring attention to and how we do that. Yeah. 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 And sometimes, yeah, I say, oh, this feels heavy and serious. And, and I think maybe, Laura, I'll just add this one last sentence. It also, there's a lot of care there. Yeah. You're picking up on people's emotions, but there's just to notice there's also the wish. It's not just, the emotions that are overwhelming, but I think in there, there's also the wish to support people. Yeah. So not wanting them to be angry, not just because it's not comfortable for you. And sometimes we can tune into that, which is like a very quiet part of what's happening and feel the strength in that kindness, which doesn't mean you then need to do anything about those emotions. Yeah. But you just kind of are um, supported. Okay. Yeah. Someone was saying on this weekend, you know, it's like doing this together. You have the sense of the strong back for the soft heart. And he didn't know this, but it's actually something that Jane Halifax says. Yeah, having the strong back for the soft heart, yeah, which allows us to move through life and to let things move, move through us, knowing it's not all ours to fix. Yeah, not all ours to fix. So thank you, everyone. Um, I will keep the, the live stream going for another five minutes so people can say goodbye in the chat. Much gratitude for me, for all of you, for your practice, your presence, uh, the wonderful questions um, and the listening. And I will see you tomorrow. Go well and take care.